morning. I want to say everybody, thank you for uh, joining this this webinar talk. Uh, my name is Craig Humphrey. I am a, a behavior analyst and chief quality officer at Hope. Um, this this talk is sort of uh, well. First of all, a little bit about me. I've been at Hope since 1999. Um, I carried a behavior caseload for around 15, 16 years, and about five and a half, six years ago, moved over to quality, and so now. Uh, do more OBM outcome type data. But in my 16 or so years in behavioral health, worked with uh, caseload kiddos here at Hope. I did school consultations. Also in the last 20 years, done a lot of trainings in uh, applied behavior analysis, learning theory, discrete trial training, autism, disabilities, inclusion, um, human rights, and, and so forth. So a lot of different things, a lot of different hats. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about proactive programming in the home and classroom. And this is sort of a, um, conglomerate of several talks I've done over the years. And I wanted, I kept finding things that kept coming up and kept being general strategies that we talked about with teachers and administrators. So I wanted to put this all in uh, in one new PowerPoint. And I hope you find a lot of the information uh, new and exciting and some of it may be reviewed, but at least it's something that you can use within your classrooms or other learning settings. This virtual format's a little bit different. I'm used to being, uh, in person and looking at nonverbals and interacting with people. So getting getting used to the zoominess of this uh, is gonna be a little bit different, but uh, we'll get through it. You do have a, ch a chat box. I have that open. Um, I will have time at the end for questions. Um, if we go over, that's fine. I have no problem going over to answer questions. Um, but I got a lot of materials. So without further uh, ado, I will get going. Um, so today's discussion, I call it sort of a behavioral appetizer smorgasbord. Um, I call it that because we have a lot of small, simple strategies that often can be very effective with a lot of kids in all different types of settings with and without disabilities. There's a lot of general information. Um, we, you know, some of it is really, really straightforward and basic and seems like commonsensical and other things are a little bit more uh, new and novel that um, we'd use with various school districts in helping support the classrooms. Um, Specifically, um, we're looking at, oh, my screen locked up. There we go. I'm going to talk about reinforcement reminders and reasons for behavior. Very, very brief, because we only have an hour. Uh, get into some programming strategies, positive programming, general strategies. And then I'm going to get into uh, tools you can use and some frequent, addressing frequent concerns that I, I often heard throughout the years from parents, administrators, teachers, and so forth. And then again, some, some question and answer if we have uh, time or you have uh, pressing questions that you would like to discuss with me. So just as a reminder, I always say this, this is general information. These are consultation-based strategies. While they are all positive-based, um, any one of these could encompass a lot more discussion. I mean, it's something that you need to take into account, behavioral function, consulting with the team and all team members, and the, the function level of the kiddo. Um, we could obviously talk a lot about any one of these more so than in the time that we have, but just keep in mind um, each individual case that, that it, with the, within your caseload or within your, your classroom is going to be a little bit different. So it's not a one size fits all, but there is a lot of good information here that you can take back and maybe use to help um, with some strategies within your classroom and learning environments by consulting with your team and other behavior specialists or behavior analysts. So I'm going to get going with uh, reinforcement, sort of the backbone of behavior. And I love this cartoon. Um, you can see the guy going back and forth with his dog. And it's it's sort of comical when you look at it from a behavioral function perspective. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of that here in a second. The um, moving my screen over just a little bit. All right. So I normally start out my talks with this this quote and this quote says I want to teach coach work with kids not deal with behavior problems and I've heard this for many I've heard this back when I was teaching uh, learning theories to it was an educational class for teachers and I got teachers say I just I don't need to learn this behavior stuff I just want to teach teach kids I don't want to deal with behavior problems and I've heard that all the way up in consulting with schools talking with administrators even with coaches I just want to coach I want to be dealing with behavior challenges 
And I guess the question is, what is wrong with this statement? Well, if we were interacting and you were here live, you could give me some feedback and, and, and pick my brain um, and give your, your input as that. Well, in general, I mean, we have behaviors. The behaviors that you see that I'm exhibiting, that you're exhibiting, these have been developed and maintained over time. And that's, you know, how we interact and learn. You know, you, you do a behavior and there's a consequence and you learn that behavior and, and that, that becomes you. Now, unfortunately, there are behaviors that are not always good. Uh, they can be bad. And those bad behaviors um, can basically, if they've paid off for that individual, they will be continued to be reinforced and they will be continued to be exhibited. And so the basically means behavior challenges can be an inherent part of all social educational settings. Um, it's not something that you, everywhere you go, you're going to have some type of behavior challenge uh, from an individual that you may or may not have to deal with. So some real basic behavior uh, overview of behavior and how, how behaviors are shaped and learned. So first of all, you've got um, an organism. So a person interacts with the environment. That's the behavior. That organism behavior is going to result some in some type of consequence. Now, if those consequences are favorable, meaning it meets that individual's need at that time, that behavior is going to be repeated in the future and that behavior is going to increase. And this is how that good and bad behavior, uh, you know, label develop. Because I can think of a lot of bad behaviors that pay off for kids and they continue to be exhibited even though they know it's a bad behavior. It's functional for them. So if it's bad on the surface and it meets that individual's need, it's going to be repeated. Um, and so the old saying, uh, many of my supervisors, um, Dr. Don, um, in school, we do what we do because we happen, because of what happens to us when we do it. And so that is a big, big piece of the information as to why we do certain things. So moving on, basically you've got functions of behavior. Because an individual learns that their behavior has a payoff, there's a reason for it. It functions in a certain way. Now, I have basic functions of behavior listed. Now, I had a little asterisk there. These are simplified for this presentation. This is not the lingo that you're gonna find in the ABA literature. Obviously, if you go into the journals and you go into functional analysis methodology, you're gonna find way more specific and more detailed information about behavioral function. So that's just a little caveat. Just wanna make sure you guys know that. So the basic functions of behavior for the purpose of this talk basically to get something and to make something aversive go away. So to get something, to make something you don't like go away. Those are the two things which, if you start looking at behavior from a, a functional perspective, you're gonna start seeing patterns into why certain people or why certain kids act in certain ways. And so we'll elaborate a little bit more upon that here in a second. So reinforcement function of behavior, you know, that is how functions develop, their behavior is reinforced. Reinforcement is defined and it's anything up, it's right there on the slide. Anything delivered or removed after behavior response, which causes that frequency to increase or maintain in the future. Now, there's really two kinds. There's, that can be positive or negative. Positive, and when I say positive and negative, this is where there's a lot of confusion because a lot of people think positive means good, negative means bad. And actually I was getting some other resources for this and I found an article in the Washington Post that totally butchered negative reinforcement. They were considering it punishment. And this is in a, 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 a it's, it was an online and it's a national subscription uh, um, newspaper. So basically the positive and negative refers to if something was added or removed after the behavior response. Um, so positive a stimulus is added after the behavior response, meaning something was delivered or, or earned or accessed. Negative means something was removed, meaning uh, something was taken away or uh, eliminated after the behavior response. So those are the, the, the two big classes, positive and negative reinforcement. They still cause an increase in behavior. And that's where a lot of people get hung up on that. I'm going to show you some examples here in a second. So. Here is actually a real basic example. Positive reinforcement presents something after response. A teacher gives a verbal praise statement, a small collectible for, token for uh, completing calendar time with nice hands and feet. And so as a result, sitting nicely, if sitting nicely increases in the future, that verbal praise statement, that token is reinforcing and that 
uh, behavior is going to increase. And so we see on the right, Homer giving, you know, the woohoo as far as a reinforcement statement and uh, so a positive reinforcement example. Negative reinforcement is, is something where it's removed. So during a fire alarm, John puts on sound dimming ear protection to block out the loud siren and where wearing ear protection increases and continues in the future. If it does increase in the future, that is reinforcing to John and it, it, it's considered reinforcement. So my computer keeps locking up here for a second. And then there's Homer avoiding something or having something negative uh, be, be uh, removed or eliminated. So some other examples, just here's some other real general examples. You're probably fairly familiar with some of these. So we work to get money and buy a new TV. We press on an accelerator to make a car move forward. We tell a joke to get laughter and attention. In the case of an education, student signs more to get more snack. And this last one I put on here on purpose because a lot of people are, may be sort of confused by it. I give a drop of hot jalapeno mustard on a tongue for a gross motor imitation training or discrete trial training. And I put that little asterisk there because I've given this example. People are like, well, wait a minute, that's punishment. Well, not necessarily. Remember, you got to look at the what the behavior responds to it. Now, this, this young man had autism. He was hyposensitive to touch, hyposensitive to taste, and he really only enjoyed hot, hot, spicy foods. So as far as doing discrete trials or um, stimulus response, you know, doing gross motor imitation, reinforcing that, we would work one-on-one -on -one with him. And after each imitation uh, action, we would give him a drop of hot jalapeno mustard on his tongue. And he loved it. Now, if I was to use M&Ms or candy or chips or something that, you know, quote, normal reinforcers, he wouldn't have responded at all. And it would have been probably more of a punisher and his behavior would have gone down. So that's the thing. You got to look at the effect on the behavior. Um, that's a, a really, really good example because a lot of people would not be thinking in terms of that being reinforcing to that extent. So some negative reinforcement examples, you have a cool, cool drink to soothe the dry, a dry mouth. You wear sunglasses to get rid of uh, bright light in your eyes. You call in sick to avoid meeting with your boss or you call in sick to avoid giving a talk uh, or a student bangs his head or her head to get out of a loud auditorium environment. We've seen a lot of that. Um, if you've worked in, in the field of disabilities, kids will engage in various behaviors to avoid things that they don't like. So just some real basic examples um, showing differences between positive and negative reinforcement. Now, when we use reinforcement in a teach, teaching situation, the thing that reinforce, it does a lot of different things, but it really communicates what behavior is expected. That basically communicates to that person, hey, you just did something good. And it actually leads to chemical changes in the brain and facilitates that learning. Um, as, as we say in the behavioral health department, it's like clinical brain surgery without a scalpel. And so the more you do this, the more reinforcement, you get more changes in the brain, more neurons forming, and then that learning takes place. And that's sort of why reinforcement is such a big deal because everybody learns to reinforcement. So some pet peeves. I've always had these pet peeves. Sometime in the last 15, 20 years, I've heard these throughout the course of talking with people or, or talking with uh, just in general at trainings. We tried reinforcement, it doesn't work with them. I don't know why his aggression keeps getting worse and worse. I keep using time out with him and he still keeps throwing materials. Well, here's the the funny thing about it is that, as I say, if behavior is reinforced, it's going to keep continuing. So everybody learns to reinforcement. Just because you don't see behavior change with reinforcement doesn't mean it doesn't work. You just haven't found the right reinforcer. If someone's aggression is getting worse and worse, something is reinforcing. We just don't know what it is. We have to dig further into that. And same thing with timeouts. Timeout is, is one uh, response to a behavior. You remove an individual from the table or from the setting. If timeout is being used and his behavior keeps getting worse, and so I use timeout with a kiddo who throws materials, obviously being removed from the, the situation is probably reinforcing that, that throwing material. So it's probably a function of escape. So not, that, not to poke fun at these, but these are just things that it's sort of an educational piece to really point out that we all learn through reinforcement and behaviors you see continue to be maintained. Something is reinforcing it. So proactive programming, that's the title of this, this our, our talk today. So what, what is proactive programming? Well, really it's, it's an antecedent intervention and other proactive uh, supports in the environment 
that um, we manipulate and we use it to make that environment very, very rich and very, very potentially reinforcing and to help um, minimize the potential for aberrant target behaviors. I mean, that's sort of the, the, the general uh, definition of it. We use uh, robust schedules of reinforcement. Um, we basically want to make the likelihood of a, a desired behavior high and the, the likelihood of an inappropriate behavior very, very low. And again, a lot of these are, are very basic, very proactive, very positive based. And, and a lot of it's going to say, oh, that really makes sense. But and, and you'll see examples of this in everyday life. And I'm going to share that with you in a little bit um, later today, too. So in a nutshell, you can think strategies that will help structure the environment for success, strategies to help communicate information and the expectations, strategies to set the environment up to support teaching and positive behaviors, and actually ways to facilitate success for the teacher, the coach, the educator as well, because we all want to be successful. If we're spinning our wheels and, and doing things in the classroom or on the ice or in a teaching environment and they're not working, you're just going to, you're going to shut down. I mean, you're going to try doing other things. You're going to, you're just not going to buy into it. And also the learner. If the learner is not being successful, he or she, uh, they, they may shut down as well. I mean, so we want to make sure that we're doing as much to help them be successful, come into contact with reinforcement and, and learn. So these are the general areas and strategies I'm going to introduce uh, and, and talk, give a little, little bit of background on. Then I'm going to um, formulate a, a, a sort of tools you can use section, which has parts of these incorporated into it. So we're going to talk about target behavior selection work break routines, uh, staff consistency, or excuse me, integrating choices, staff consistency, ending on success, and, and quote, the, the golden rule. Um, again, very, very uh, general in some areas, but they, they have a lot of simplistic things within it that uh, can really help support kids in the classroom or kids in learning environments. So the first one is target behavior selection. So think about when we behave or when we first learn something and all the different behaviors that we exhibit as a person. It took many, many years for those behaviors to, to develop. And the same go for inappropriate behaviors. You don't just learn overnight that X behavior gets you something and it may not be the most appropriate behavior. It takes time for those to develop. And there's different reinforcement schedules which help you know, support or maintain those behaviors. But it took many, many years for individual inappropriate behaviors to develop. They're not just gonna go away at once. It's gonna take some time. A lot of, uh, one common mistake I've seen in, in, in this, you know, a lot of, several different situations is trying to address too many behaviors all at the same time. And so basically if you've got four or five or six different behaviors you're trying to reduce or trying to you know get to a, a more manageable level, the student's probably not going to be successful, the teacher's not going to be successful, and that leads to that learned helplessness. Basically meaning, hey, this I, I'm not winning. I'm just, I'm just going to shut down. I'm not even going to try. And so the kid can shut down, the teacher can shut down, and so forth. And also it just interferes with just the general buy into any type of behavior program and the buy into any type of intervention. So here's an example. We had a student, uh, this was at one of the, the area schools. Uh, she had echolalia, she hand flapped, she had odyssey behavior and ver verbal stereotypy. So some scripting, some movie scripts and, and, and so forth. So a lot of busy stuff and the teacher was trying to address all these behaviors within one huge behavior program uh, at the same time. Well, the thing which with, with this young lady, her attention to task was around two minutes maximum. And so it, it, after about two minutes, she would be uh, you know, totally distracted. The teacher was trying to reinforce total compliance in like 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minute work activities. And so this young lady never came into contact with reinforcement. It became frustrating for her, it became frustrating for the teacher. She basically shut down. She was doing a lot of skate motivated behavior because she might be at the work setting and so forth. And so we had to really reshape the way that the program was set up. So you got to pick your battles. Are there things that can be ignored? I mean, what, what is really, really important? I mean, I had one, one teacher who was so worried about the kid rocking in his chair that she kept trying to do discrete trial to get him to sit totally still. But I know you and I, I, I'm, I tap my feet, I rock back and forth. I mean, you're sitting in a meeting and you've got those chairs, you're back and forth. You've got to have a little bit of self stimulation to, to stay focused. So sitting, sitting still versus rocking and moving on the bottom or sitting on your foot, you know, sort of pick your battle. Completing parts of an assignment versus a whole assignment. I mean, I, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, we can't break up that assignment, he's got to do the whole thing. I mean, 
what's the matter? Have them do one or two problems, take a quick break, come back, do two more, take a quick break. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can break that up to help ensure that success. So, so here's another, another example. We had um, discrete trial training learning protocol and we wanted the, the, the kiddo seated in a chair, feet on floor, and tension forward. And the teacher had been trying to start at 10 seconds. So they would say, get ready, prompt, up count to 10, and then reinforce. Well, after about three, four seconds, lost. And so he would run out and it would be a power struggle and so forth. So we had to go very, very small time frame, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, and work up from that duration. Now, obviously, is that gonna, you know, that's very time intensive, but we we had a one-on-one -on -one aid and we were able to do this, but it was just the starting point was too high for this, this young man. Same thing with sports. And I see this in the learn to play. I, I've coached hockey many years. Uh, I grew up playing it since I was like three or four. I've been coaching for the last 15 years. Still coach to this day, coach two teams and play myself. So I see a lot of things, a lot of mistakes made it like in, in, the, in the learn to play division and, and even the might, the, the six U and eight U teams. We, we've got people that are worried about teaching, you know, fine motor puck control and shooting and, and all this and position play when the kid can't even bend knees and do basic edge work and skate. So we got to start with skating mechanics and get repetition on that and then move into stationary puck control and passing shooting and then integrate position play over time. You, you sort of looking at the big picture as to what's important. Skating is the biggest thing in hockey and you've got to make sure you have a good fundamentals before you move on to all these other uh, related aspects. So pre-macking. Pre-macking comes from David Premack. He's a, a behavioral psychologist way back when. Um, he basically, uh, Premack principle states that you take a high probability behavior and use that as a reinforcer for a low probability behavior. So let me give it, this is called grandma's love. You can have a piece of cake after you eat your peas. Eating cake, a high probability behavior, eating peas or eating your corn, low probability behavior. So it's very easy for each your cake, eat your peas, then you get your cake. I mean, that's what grandma used to always say. Well, what we like to do, we can take the same principle and work it into a work break, work break routine. So you start with a high demand task, you follow up with a low demand task. High demand something maybe that you don't like, schoolwork, matching, uh, handwriting, whatever, something a low demand, a high probability behavior, you know, going for a walk, a sensory break, uh, playing with Lego, something along those lines. And you can start putting this into a routine, a high demand, low demand, high demand, low demand, and that helps get you through that day. And we, we, we do this naturally as adults. I know when I was working on this talk, I would work for you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes and take a quick break and then come back and do more. I mean, that's, that's sort of how it, how it works. We have been able to do job carving um, to help achieve this. In, in one of my cases over um, outside of Springfield, this young man was very sensory driven, very hyposensitive, loved deep pressure, and often would act out because he knew he could be restrained and loved deep pressure. And so it's sort of a self, uh, self perpetuating cycle. The more he acted out, the more he got hands on with the staff. Well, this young man, we were able to get him into a schedule where he would do a little bit of work and then he loved pushing carts because of the proprioceptive feedback. So we made up various items that he could deliver that had various weights in them to different classrooms. We started doing this throughout the morning and throughout the afternoon. Uh, it was very simple, very enjoyable, but we had to carve out things for him to do. And it was naturally working those into his day. And so the motivation to escape was very low. We started over a very, very short duration and then we worked up. We did the same thing with another young man who liked to deliver things to the office and other classrooms. We made, had blank envelopes with various classrooms written on them. And he would do that several times in the morning, several times in the afternoon, got him out of his classroom, got some gross motor and, and fine motor stuff into his day. And then we faded that to a, a more appropriate schedule, but we had to be creative and, and do some job carving to achieve that. The third one is basically, if anyone who's a parent knows this is a really cool trick, integrating choices within a structured schedule, especially. So it gives students that choice of, oh, I can have some input into something. So simple language. So let's say it's dinner time and you got a kid who only likes to drink sugary soda pop. Well, offering, which would you like, water or juice or juice or milk? It gives them two concrete choices and there's really no other option. And the neat thing is you can use this with a choice board, uh, basically a visual. And visuals are sort of like uh, the magic 
I mean, we've had kids that we tell rules to, but if we put it in a visual, the visual, you can, it's on the rule sheet. You cannot, that's what the rules say, I got to follow it. And so you've got the, uh, the picture of juice and the picture of milk. Now the source of the request comes from the picture and not the parent, not the teacher. And so it's way more concrete, way more uh, salient, and they, they're able to make, make that uh, choice and have overall fewer power struggles. Something relatively straightforward and simple, but it's something that um, is, is quite effective. Consistency, this is that magic area, which is often the hardest to implement. You've got to, you got to be consistent in the way you teach and the way you react. And so we actually use video recordings to demonstrate effectiveness uh, of teaching with a student. Um, we had a young man here who, who had a, a, a coffee and a, a soda pop program, and we had to videotape a teacher working with him and a way to do it correctly. And we use that for training the other staff that worked with him. Um, just one, one, the teaching piece of it is so huge. And so use that video, use that feedback to help train staff. And similarly, when you have responses to students' behaviors, your response to them. We want to make sure when you see those behaviors you like in maximum enthusiasm, you got to draw that attention to it. You can't just go through the motion, oh, good job, whatever. I mean, be excited, really, really celebrate those, those, those small successes. Conversely, those calm the, the calm reactions when you see something you don't want, don't attend to it. We have a way out program here at Hope where if a kid's dropped to the floor and isn't hurting him or herself, we move on, we wait them out, we count tiles, we don't draw attention to it. Once they start engaging, we start giving them attention for getting up and getting back in the transition. Lastly, ending tests, ending tasks on a successful note or positive note. Often, we all know that kid disrupts, throws materials, a lot of times that task is going to end. It's better to end early, end on success, take a quick break and come back and resume it if needed than to try and push and try and push and try and push and try and get them through that entire activity. And then boom, all hell breaks loose and now you got a major meltdown. Um, and that helps minimize that escape extinction um, in terms of keeping the kid there and coming to contact with the reinforcer. And I misspoke. Lastly, the golden rule, catching kids being good. Um, Society, we live in a reactive society. Cops don't pull you over to tell you you're going to speed limit. Now, there's a little asterisk there. There are some new studies out there that are being done where cops are sending gift cards and, and giving monetary, monetary rewards based upon GPS uh, speeds posted in cars and so forth. I got that in the resources. You can look and read that if you want. But when you react to misbehaviors, you often draw more attention to it, which can be really reinforcing, especially if the reinforcement for good behaviors is quite well. So catch kids being good. Um, those exaggerated reinforcement schedules, lots of lots of positive environments. It makes lots of positive reinforcement statements makes that environment extremely rewarding. This is you'll see this sometimes in a classroom that maybe isn't the most positive. The kid's having a really rough day, but then the OT or PT or speech person comes in to do therapy, and the kid turns it off and goes with a, his, her hand out the classroom and he has a great session with her. Well, she's become a conditioned reinforcer. And, you know, the old saying that we used to say around here is like, make yourself a big M&M or make your classroom a big M&M. You want to have that classroom be really, really fun. It's sort of like going to an uh, amusement park. I walk in there, I'm all smiles. It's going to be a hell of a day. I'm going to have fun. But if I want to go, you know, the dentist, uh, not so much. So make that reinforcing, that environment extremely, extremely reinforcing. Now, remember behavior specific praise along with that. Um, it's easy to say good job and way to go, but if you use very nice handwriting or very nice sitting or good shoe time, you're drawing behave, drawing that attention to that behavior, and it points out to other kids as well. Um, it's just it's just way more uh, sincere, and it's a really good way to really get enthusiastic about it. Um, just a really quick reminder, and again, it's something that probably a lot of you already do. It's just something that is sometimes overlooked. And it's easy to do and easy to. So we have had um, some self-monitoring protocols for, uh, we actually did this with a class when we, we recorded some, some uh, calendar time, some, some other carpet activities, you know, record the lessons and then watch it. You can watch it alone, watch it with your class, whatever. What are you catching? You can talk, you can track the number of reinforcer statements. You can count the, the number of prompt statements or redirection statements. We did this with one teacher and she called me up and she like, and this wasn't here, this was at a, a public school with a supervisor who was working on her thesis. She's like, Craig, I'm such a witch. And she didn't see, use the W, she used the B word. She's like, oh, I'm such an act. All I do is catch kids being bad. I said, well, then where are we going to work on it? So then we set up some protocols to help 
catch the more appropriate and, and ways to do that. So we can actually assess ourselves. You can, you can record an activity. You can note the start time. You can record the number of positive statements. The one, many, many moons ago, at one of the ABA talks, one of the consultants I went to, she wanted a six to one or eight to one good to bad ratio of statements. And that's sort of what we've been adopting. You know, when we talk to teachers, like it should be six to one, eight to one, 10 to one. I mean, if you can do six to one, that's great. If you can do even more, that's, that's, even, that's amazing. I know when I'm on the bench, I'm always looking for, you know, I can always ream somebody out for something, but I got to find two or three other things before I ream them out. <laughs> and that's really not appropriate for a student, but in a coaching situation, I'm not going to ream them out. I'm going to say, Hey, you did, all right, you did this, this awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, next time let's try, let's try to do two X and Y. So you want to, you know, keep that in mind, not in just an educational setting. It can be in, in real life, you know, the positives go a long, long way. So we actually have some, some, uh, metrics that we use and I, I put up here these are the, the marbles and pennies in right pocket you can move them over you can use clickers and counters and objectives uh, observers to count count your reinforcer statements but those were used by some teachers um, to track their own behavior i mean the one teacher had pennies in her pocket each time she rewarded somebody she would put the penny from her right pocket to her left pocket and count those up and then get a rate based upon how long the activity was we do something similar here at hope uh, we can actually count, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have an activity, we'll see the time start, the time end, we'll count the number of catch good phrases or ways or indirect ways of acknowledging good behavior. And then we can figure out a rate. And so we've been able to go through, and this is a, an actual graph from one of the classrooms. It shows that we were looking at, you can see, um, we, our goal was for one an average of one statement per minute. And you can see how the rates of these reinforcer statements were above that, which means it was a highly reinforcing classroom. So just another creative way to, to track that. There is a device out there called the Motivator, and some of you may be familiar with it. This is a small pager looking device. Um, it can, it's set to vibrate. You can do uh, intermittent times or, or fixed times, but it's a good way to prompt staff, prompt kids to do whatever behavior you wanna do. So you can actually use, have students do this to self-monitor. Um, it vibrates a student, makes a note on a data sheet if he or she is, not, is working, and then you can pair those with backup reinforcers. And you can also teach teachers to cue themselves to self monitor. It provides a, a, a stimulus to say, okay, I'm going to look. Are they working? I can provide reinforcement. I can catch something being good. And it's really, uh, not, it's not very obtrusive. It's very small, very, very quiet. And I think they even have an app now which you can pair it to a, a, a phone. Um, so that's an extremely, extremely effective way to help shape your behavior and to help shape your students' behaviors. So we did this in one classroom. We said, uh, this was a student with high functioning autism had a hard time staying on task. He was on task for around five minutes. So we had actually a little bit less than he needed, but we said for three minutes, the teacher was at a variable five and then he learned to self-monitor his task and he had um, a self-monitoring worksheet and a token program. And so we were able to slowly increase the amount of time that was on task by adjusting the motivator and then eventually fade the motivator. It took a while. It took about the whole semester to do. But by the end, he was up to 15, 20 minutes easy uh, from three minutes to start. So the other thing you can do is time sample spot checks. We've done this with high school classes or, uh, you know, the longer the block classes um, and the resource room classes. We basically we set the motivator for X amount of minutes. At the end of that minutes, you do a spot check. You look up who's working, and then you, you would provide reinforcement to those kids that are on task. It can be random, meaning they don't know when it's going to happen. That helps maintain the behavior even more. Or it could be a set time and a formal check that is announced, sort of a check-in system. Um, but it's it is just a really neat, creative way to do it, and it's really it's not very obtrusive. It's very easy to implement. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit more. I, I know I'm trying. To, I'm looking at the clock. I'm just trying to make sure I can get everything in. Focus a little bit more on reinforcement. Now we use di differential reinforcement a lot, and a lot of times this is involved with the behavior health department. There's there's three common. It's basically a method of teaching desired behavior responses by reinforcing certain ones and not reinforcing other other responses. There's three common types. There's the DRO, the DRI, and the DRA. And this is differential reinforcement, other, incompatible, and alternate, uh, respective. Real quickly, a DRO. This is an interval time base, so you've got an interval. A certain time frame. If that student can complete the interval without the occurrence of a negative target behavior that you're targeting, uh, they will receive some type of reinforcement. So the thing about it, it often uh, there could be other inappropriate behaviors taking place. So you got to watch out for that. 
Uh, you, you probably want to pair it with some type of teaching, other teaching program like a, a discrete trials as well. But you, you want to make sure that you're not inadvertently reinforcing another bad behavior because the first one that you're targeting is not taking place. So you got to sort of keep in mind of that. So here's an actual example. So DRO for self-injury, young man engaging in self-injury, hitting himself in the face. Have a timer for five minutes. Engage in the activity with him. As long as he doesn't bang himself in the face, at the end of the five minutes, he gets reinforcement. Now, here's the thing. you got to start small enough to be successful. Some target behavior, some self-injury occur at such a high rate, five minutes isn't going to be effective. So you got to go you know, maybe 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and that's where it's very time intensive. You have to need a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it, and, and again, it could, you could have other target behaviors taking place. So this is something you obviously want to consult with a behavior, uh, BCBA or BCABA to help with this because it's it's something you, you don't just want to willy nilly do it, but I want you to know it is an option out there and we have used it in classrooms. DRI, this is a response dependent uh, intervention. Basically, you have a target behavior, you find a response that is incompatible with that. Um, and that sometimes can be hard. So here's an example. So um, work completion, let's say he's out of seat behavior. So out of seat, that's the target behavior. We want to reinforce work completion. Work completion is defined being in seat, completing work. So he's at a seat, he works, he completes the assignment, turns it in, you reinforce it. So technically, being at his desk and completing work is incompatible with being out of the seat. So he can't be doing both. So by him getting more reinforcement for being in a seat and completing the work task, you're going to start to change that behavior. And then lastly, a DRE, differential reinforcement of an alternate behavior. This again is a response dependent. You find some alternate to compete with that inappropriate target behavior. Um, so an example, you've got a kid who screams during work tasks and the screaming is pretty much we learned as to way to get out of doing the work. So we have an alternate behavior. We have an I need a break card. And so we ignore screaming, talks out. We redirect him back to work. And then we when we, we probably have to prompt him the first couple of times. We say, OK, you're going to hand me your I need a break card. We're going to take a break. And then we would reinforce it. So that helps to maintain or minimize the potentially strong work tasks to get out of doing work. Rather, we're developing that I need a break card where his, his requesting behavior to get out of doing work. And again, have to start small, a short worksheet, and then use prompts to prompt the alternate behavior. So again, just really some real straightforward differential things, but to show how we can use reinforcement in different ways. As with those, we have extinction as part of that. So there's going to be times when you're going to have to ignore a certain behavior, and this can be hard because you've got to be consistent. If you aren't consistent with ignoring a behavior that's not dangerous, you can't do extinction with dangerous behaviors but it can be very, very resistant to change. This is why people gamble. If a kid gets a payoff of a behavior one out of every 10 times, it's gonna continue. And so people who gamble, you know, a slot machine one out of every 10 times are gonna to continue to gamble. So here's a real quick extinction uh, example. You know, attention for swearing is withheld. We don't give eye contact. We don't re redirect for swearing. We just allow it to, to take place. You don't act like it's not even taking, you just ignore it. Now, we often would have to have a teaching program like a DRI, and then you also may have to have a, a program so that the other students in class don't laugh every time he swears. We actually had a, a, this take place in a, a classroom where a kid made burping sounds and we would put it on extinction, but we had to put the other 20 kids on a little token program that so when John burps, the other kids don't laugh. Because if they laugh, he's getting attention for it and it's going to continue. So just, just a little uh, snippet of, of what extinction is. All right, this is sort of the, the last um, big section, the tools you can use and concerns. I want to sort of wrap all this up because I've given a lot of information and I know it can be in an hour time frame, it can be sort of overwhelming, but this is sort of the thing that I spend a lot of time with, with, with the schools and with other administrators and, and teachers because this is something that they can take back and really use today. So I, I always say, you know, a lot of times people with autism, people with disabilities, they have a lot of behavior challenges because um, they may not understand the environment. And you know, un unpredictable, unpredictable expectations, schedules, changes in schedules can lead to anxiety, stress, other inappropriate behavior, screaming, crying, tantrum, and so forth. So if you put yourself in that, that situation, so imagine if you came home from work and you didn't know your schedule. Do I work tomorrow? Do I not work tomorrow? When do I eat dinner? When do I go to bed? I don't know when my hockey games are. I'm, I, I mean, I got 
th two teams I coach and I got a third one I plan. I live and die by my schedule. I, I have to have a schedule. And so how would you feel if you were always like that on itch? If you didn't know what was going on, you would be a basket case. You would be anxious. You'd be on edge. You'd be unsure of routines. You'd be more prone to wander and seek out things to do. And then if you miss something, heaven forbid, you're going to be screaming, crying, pissed off. I mean, you're going to have a lot of emotional outbursts if you miss something. So how do our kids with autism or disabilities feel? Well, if you think about it, they're probably going to be just as anxious, if not more. They're going to be more frustrated, frustrated, more defensive, more prone to wandering. Um, no set guide in her direction. I mean, I had the same situation. I came into a classroom and this kid, is, he, he thrives on a schedule, but then they had a substitute teacher and it's like, okay, free time, go find whatever you do. And he's over in the corner self-stimming with a CD and breaking down crying because there's no set guide in her direction. Just because it's free time, there doesn't mean there, there shouldn't be a schedule. I mean, the old adage of play is work and work is play. Work is fun because it's structured. I know what to do, but play where I got to choose from toys and all that stuff, that's really, really hard. So that's the, the work part of it. Um, so basically the increased environmental structure is the biggest thing that I, I mean, I see the classes that run really, really well, their whole day, their whole environment, everything is really, really structured. Staff know what's going on, the kids know what's going on. So how can we do this? Well, we've got visual supports, carols, daily schedules, first end board statements, sequence strips, what I'm working for, incentive boards, transition timers, structured teaching, and choice boards. There's a lot of things there. I'm going to just show you some things because it's a lot easier for me to show. So carols to define work areas. You can see where the seed is down here. You can see where the carpet, the calendar, the carpet square is for calendar time. Vis carols to help block stimulation. I know in grad school, I could not study at home. I had phones and computers and TVs and all that other stuff. And I would just sit there and lose, I would not be able to focus. I had to go to the library and sit at a carol and force myself to study in that environment. And that's sort of what my routine was. I knew when I had to study and do things that would go to the library. Visual schedules, visuals, these are very simple first thens. We got first thens and we can be vertical, it can be horizontal, but I can instantly look at this and say, first we're gonna do circle time, then we're gonna do snack. Or first we're gonna eat, there's an object schedule. First we're gonna eat, then we're gonna wash up, then I brush our teeth and comb our hair. First I'm gonna brush my teeth and then get Legos. Very, very concrete. And again, you can point to this. It takes the onus off of you. It's a good way to fade yourself from that. You can point to the schedule as compared to me telling someone, okay, brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth. First brush teeth, then, then, then Legos. It helps with the fading of your verbal directives. Another visual schedule in the classroom. This is during a ESY, but you can see how the staff even know what's going on. And then you've got another uh, horizontal schedule up there. Just another way to communicate what the routine is going to be for the class. Sequence strips, another way to teach. I can tell you, you know, here's how we brush our teeth. And these are the steps. You have your toothbrush, your toothpaste, you put it on, brush your teeth and rinse them out. We'll see these for getting dressed. We'll see these for using the bathroom, for washing hands. Another good way to fade yourself. You can point to it. You can make the pictures bigger and smaller. And, and even if they're up all year, it doesn't matter. It's just another way to help prompt and promote that independence if the kid can reference them as compared to you telling them what to do each, each, each step. Incentive boards, big, big fan of what, the, what I'm working for boards or the token boards or the, the puzzle boards. Another good way to show progress through the activity. I mean, you've got the uh, star board here where he can earn a computer for five stars. And the nice thing about having this, you can maybe give two stars right off the bat for sitting down at the table and then slowly do the last three uh, throughout the next three and a half minutes, four minutes of the activity and he gets this computer. Same thing down the lower right hand corner, he can choose or she can choose, they can choose whatever uh, reinforcer they're working for, and then you can cover those up for each step of the, uh, the activity and, and earn that. Uh, Thomas the Train, you get the whole puzzle of Thomas and it shows, hey, I got Thomas, you get time with your Thomas the Train. Visuals, communicate those expectations, very, very good for showing progress through the activity. Lots of other feedback things. Anyone who's got kids, no one we're going on a long road trip. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, you got a timer. Time timers are great. You've got the time here that starts to, as it counts down, the, the red will disappear. You can have it on a watch. Regular visual timer. This is one when you've got uh, 10 minutes learning, you got green light, one to 10 minutes remaining, yellow, and then zero to 60 is red. And this upper right is the Yacker Tracker. It gives feedback as to how loud the sound is in the classroom. Just another way to give that feedback. 
people respond to visuals. Don't be afraid to use visuals. Instructions and structured teaching, you know, work sequences to do and finish, a little picture on how to assemble something, very, very structured. You know, you've got the activities here, what you do in order, what you work on when you're done and so forth. Just another way to help structure that environment. Communication boards, how you feel, things you need, what the menu is gonna be. This bottom right was used with one of the kiddos here at, at Hope in terms of helping uh, moods and emotions. We have a, a young uh, man who uses pictures to help collect data on self-reporting for mood symptoms. And it, it, it's just a really, really good way to um, help communicate and express and, and, and facilitate communication between uh, emotions and what you need and, and what's gonna take place in a very, very concrete way. So increasing that environmental structure, the thing which a lot, one of the consultants that I, I what we went to at, at ABBA said that kids with autism are visual learners living in a very auditory world. And that makes a lot of sense. You think about it. There's a lot of words, a lot of words, a lot of words, a lot of processing time. But if we can break that down into visuals that are more easily processed, helps keep everyone informed about what the routine is. It helps support consistency in routines and expectations. So the, the second tool, and anyone who knows me, um, this is sort of related. We've already talked about reinforcement, catch them being good. Positive, 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 catch them being good. Often we take things away for inappropriate behavior. Well, that doesn't necessarily communicate what is expected. At least power struggles, reinforcement communicates what's expected. Re punishment just tells you what not to do. Reinforcement tells you what you should be doing. So let's use lots and lots of reinforcement. Remember that six to one rule, eight to one rule, increasing reinforcement during high demand is gonna communicate what the activity is, what is appropriate, and, and it, it helps shape that positive behavior. Um, and if it's a high rate of reinforcement during the activity, it's the potential they're going to want to leave and escape that task is going to go down. So high rates of reinforcement. Again, these are some of the things I've, I've got some of these in the concerns as well, but uh, we shouldn't have to use edible so stickers soda to reinforce show. Mary should just behave naturally. I don't believe I'm bribing kids to behave. Oh, I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I heard this, well, remember reinforcement is how we learn. You, it's okay to use frequent reinforcement. I remember the first time I was tripping. There's so many examples I could give. I mean, my my son hated clippers. At the, he, he hated getting his hair cut. And so I had a thing at M&M's and he's sitting there and literally after sitting in a chair, little M&M, the clipper come close to him, M&M, little sit snip, m and I'd much rather catch and support that behavior and fade, them, fade it over time than to try and have him sit there for the whole five or 10 minutes and then he loses it and never comes into contact with the reinforcement. Remember that six to one rule. Lots of frequent reinforcement, catch kids being good. It's gonna help shape that behavior. They're gonna perform better. Um, come into contact with a reinforcement, they're gonna learn. Help that clinical brain surgery, help that learning process. Ensuring success, I think I mentioned this already, just recap, don't wanna end on a misbehavior. If a misbehavior takes place and you, you push the kid back or pull the kid back from the, the, in his chair, let him calm down, they can come back um, three and four, I'm sort of skipping ahead, three and four, ensure success and, and, and um, finish one more are on the same side here. But you want to ensure success. you much rather take a break, give them a little bit of time, do, do a, a gross motor activity, then come back and finish it. Um, but you don't want to end a success on a, a, a misbehavior. So here's, a, here's um, um, with this, we talked about the pre-macking schedule, how we can alternate between high demand and low demand throughout an activity. That's a good way to help ensure success because it's a, a high demand task, low demand task. They know it's coming up in their schedule and there's less motivation for them to, to do a misbehavior. So ensure that success to um, help make sure that uh, you can start small and then increase the amount of time that they're working so they are successful in the activity and you don't have to worry about shaping escape motivated behavior. Now, returning to task, this is the one I've sort of got stumbled up on here. If a misbehavior does take place and you have to relocate or push the kid back in his chair, let him calm down, have him come back and do one more task on that activity. This shows that you need to complete the work task on a successful note versus ending a work task on a misbehavior, which again promotes uh, escape motivated behavior. So here's an actual example. Here's Mike, he's working on a worksheet. Halfway through, he throws it and tries to hit appear. For safety reasons, you've moved them away, 
And after several minutes, he calms down, then you go outside and take him for a walk in the hallway and get him a drink of water. That's probably not the best thing. I was good that you relocated him from the, the table for safety reasons, but once he calms down, have him come back to the table, do one more task, one more step of that task, and then go take a walk and get a drink. That way he's ending, he's completing that task as compared to um, ending the work task on that misbehavior and going out and getting more reinforcement one-on-one -on -one time for it. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Remember, every opportunity is a learning opportunity. You know, work on requesting behavior, snack time more, please, signing. Uh, when you're, you're driving or going around the mall, work on colors, shapes, you know, working on, on, on letters. I mean, use grandma's law, pre you know, do X and then you get Y, a high problem. You know, you can have your cake after you finish your peas. You can, you can watch television after you finish your handwriting. Um, just some real simple ways to structure things and, and, and promote every opportunity to, to, to work on things and, and, and learn. So the last section is the sounds great, but, and these are the concerns and common things we often hear. And I've, again, I've heard a lot of things throughout the years and these are probably some of the better, better ones. Number one, Philip doesn't need to use visuals or Philip knows his schedules. He doesn't need a schedule. Well, you know, we all use schedules. We all use visuals. How do you find the bathroom in Germany? When you're, I don't speak German, when I get to Germany, I had to use a sign to find where the, where the bathroom was. So here's my signs of the times. And I really, really like some of these. I mean, I can look up here, I can see where the baggage claim is. I can tell I don't wanna go down here because there's a lot of detour signs. I can tell where the accessible parking, accessible entrance is, even though I don't even know what language it is. Slow moving vehicle, same thing here. There's baggage claim and ground transportation. We all process visuals. I can look out there, I, can, I know when I'm leaving here, I see that red octagon, I'm starting to hit the brake before I even process that. Um, signs of the times, visuals are out there, we use them every day. Look on the highways, look in the airports, look in the grocery store, just look at how many visuals are out there. So don't be afraid to use visuals and structure that environment to make it as most meaningful as possible. Here's another real life example. Um, and you can read this. It's this a description of a hockey drill. Two lines on a diagonal corner of a rink, eight to 10 cones basically down each side of the rink. One side had the players skate around the cones, keeping the puck in the middle. Other side players skate around the middle of the cones, stick on the puck. It's like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? Well, I'll just show you this. That's what it is. So we got one side, they're doing a slalom, the other side, they're skating down the middle, doing reach out around the cone. Way much easier. Use visuals. I tell you, I use, I use obviously a whiteboard when I coach, but I actually make it even more fun. I draw on the ice. I draw the drill on the ice and it gets the little kids like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Helps promote that communication, that promotes communicating what is expected, how long it's going to be, what we're going to do. Um, just visuals, everyday life, everybody uses visuals. John doesn't need a schedule or to-do list. Well, again, increases predictability, minimizes errors, minimizes anxiety. How many times have you forgotten an item because you go to the grocery store without a list? How many times have you tried to put together that stereo rack from Ikea and you do it without the, the paper and you put it on backwards? Yeah, um, so don't be afraid. Lots and lots of visuals, again, signs of the times. We've got, here's your shopping list. We've got our Outlook calendar here. This is an actual calendar in our therapy data management system. We got our phone with our calendar and our coaches. This is actually a, a FlexCoach app. It has, uh, you can use it on an iPad, which has animation. So it's even more cool than drawing on the ice, but Craig doesn't want to pay that much for it. So uh, to-do list. So signs of the times, lots and lots of predictability, lots and lots of structure very, very, very much it helps support appropriate behavior. And again, here's some models, just again, showing the visuals that we use every day. Number three, we don't believe in using food as a reward or a bribe. Well, bribery, it's not bribery. We, bribery is a totally different definition. We are using an immediate reinforcer to reinforce a specific behavioral response. Edibles are one type, they're primary. That means it satisfies a biological need. Now we have to use items that are motivating to that individual. Is it hot mustard? Is it an M&M? Is it a tickle? Whatever it is, you've got to use something that is motivating to that youth. Just because we're using food doesn't mean we're going to stay there. We might take that bag of chips, break it up into a million little pieces and give them one little chip after every two responses. But over time, we're, we're going to pair it with verbal praise and over time, we're going to pull back that edible and we're going to fade it to a more more natural reinforcer type, verbal praise, point systems, tokens, but you got to start somewhere. 
if you don't have something to start with, it's going to be, it, you don't, there's very little motivation to engage in the behavior. There's no connection. They don't come in contact with the reinforcer. Those chemical changes don't take place. So it's okay to use food, but let's use things that are motivating to the kiddo, motivating to that individual. We shouldn't have to bribe John to behave. Again, bribery, it's, we're using a contingency. If you do X, you will receive Y. A bribe is given before the behavior. So a, a business gives a congressman $50,000 to vote a certain way. They give him the money first, then he goes vote. That's a bribe. We are using contingency. If you do X, you receive Y. And I always say, what is your reinforcer? A lot of you guys out there, I know me, it's, it's the whole environment of hope, but would you work for free? I love hope, but I need money too. I mean, we all have bills and, and real life and everything else, but would you work for free? And maybe for a little while, but it wouldn't last because real life requires a little bit of money. And so reinforcement for doing uh, your, your job, you get a paycheck and you also get to see the, the shaping and changing and, and interaction with all the kids and coworkers. We don't have time. Well, parents, especially parents, are, oh, I don't have time to do this. Well. A lot of times you don't realize how much reactive time you're spending on redirecting behaviors, um, the amount of negative attention, the amount of time they're doing it. And it just really, you could probably focus in on a, uh, doing some positive based stuff, proactive stuff, and it would be just as much work, if not less work. So here's what we did. We actually did this. Uh, we said, pick a time. So let's pick a 60 minute time frame, a 90 minute time frame that you can do a consistent intervention, you know, a schedule, some reinforcer protocols. Implement that for two weeks and evaluate the progress. It doesn't have to be all day. Just pick pick a certain time. Frame. We did this with um, um, a family. They had two kids with autism, and we I said just get, trust, me, give it a shot. So we focus on that three thirty to five o'clock or three thirty to four thirty time frame, right after school, transitioning home, washing up, getting a snack. They implemented it for like five days, four days. They call me. I just wanted them to do it for a week. We were going to reconvene and talk about it. They did it for like four or five days. They called me and they said, oh my gosh, this is awesome. They, they automatically extended it to the weekend and they were doing it themselves. And they were just like, this is such, this is gold. And so they were extremely, extremely happy. Um, so pick that one, one time, give it a shot and, and trust me. So this is my summary. In summary, we talked about reinforcement. We talked about why behaviors take place to get something to make something go away. That's that's obviously not the clinical definition of from an ABA, but if you can start thinking in terms of those, those behavioral functions or reasons, you're gonna start looking at, at scenarios and why kids behave in certain ways in, in, in a whole different perspective. And it'll help you determine context for, for interventions and what you may need to do to help, to help support, support them. And then lastly, remember, the maximize that predictability, increase that environmental stimulation incorporate robust schedules of reinforcement to positively and proactively condition the environment and ensure success. You know, really catch those good behaviors, really, really reinforce that, and then, you know, help structure that environment and minimize the potential for, for problem behaviors. I know I threw a lot at you. That was a very, very quick hour. I can't believe it's already over. Um, I do have some references and resources here. I think um, if you are interested you can send me, there's my contact information. Um, you can send me an email. I can, I can export this out as a PDF because it's too big to email. It's very, I can either take the pictures out, but I can get this to you if you want to have a, and it might, I think um, we, I'm not sure what the, the speakers bureau is going to be. I know we are recording this for future reference as well, um, but there's my information. If you have questions, definitely uh, reach out to me. But um, so I do have, I know we're right at an hour, but if there is anybody, if there are any questions in you, I'm trying to see if anybody had any questions, um, you can put them in the text box or um, I can stop sharing and maybe get back to this. There's a Q&A, but if there's nothing, there's a new message, okay? Let me see. Let me see. Okay, I got an email. Yeah, I can. If you send me your email or send me requests, um, go ahead, Amber. Um, email me 
just because I don't know if I'll have, I'm going to have to take a screenshot of this to, to uh, Ambership and let you know to get it. But if you want to email me, I can reply to your email and send the, the slides via a PDF. Um, and Jody says we did record this and it will be posted later. So we can come back and you can look at it in more detail. Um, outside of that, I appreciate your time. I know, again, a lot of information, short amount of time, but I, I really, I love talking about this stuff. I'm, I, I get sort of excited and, and, and passionate about things. And, and that's sort of the way I am when it comes to behavior. But I hope I can, you know, give you some tools that you too can become passionate and, and help in supporting your kids and, and students in learning in applied settings. So um, I think that's about it. So I'm going to say thank you and sign off. And you guys have a great rest of the week. Thank you again.